let us now begin our Neuroanatomy 101 on how we can simplify the cortical bulbar tract. The key word for bulbar is the brainstem, where the nuclei of the lower cranial nerves are found. So let's talk about the cortical bulbar pathway. Now the cortical bulbar pathway is also known as the cortical nuclear pathway. So the term nuclear because of the nuclei. The nuclei of the cranial nerves which are found on the brainstem. So the main function of the cortical bulbar tract is to carry efferent motor information. So always remember, same, sensory is afferent, motor is efferent. So your mnemonics here is same, sensory is afferent, motor is efferent. So the cortical bulbar tract will carry motor efferent information from the primary motor cortex to the muscles of the face, the head, and the neck. Please remember this. Again, what descending pathway carries efferent motor information to the muscles of the face, the neck, and the head. It is the cortical bulbar tract. Now, one main difference between the cortical bulbar tract and the cortical spinal tract is that unlike the cortical spinal tract, the lower motor neurons of the cortical nuclear tract are found in the motor cranial nerve nuclei, which are found in the brain stem. Now, can you put in the chat box, what are the cranial nerves which are found in the brain stem? So we have nine, 10, 11, and 12. So we have glossopharyngeal, we have the vagus nerve, we have the spinal accessory, and we have the hypoglossal nerve. So please take note, the lower four cranial nerves are found in the brainstem. So clinically, a patient with a lesion or damage to the cortical bulbar tract would present with difficulty in swallowing, they would have difficulty in speech, so they're going to have dysphagia, they're going to have dysarthria, they're going to have problems with phonation and swallowing. It's because the nuclei of cranial nerve 9, 10, 11, 12 are found in the brainstem. So we mentioned this earlier that the cortical bulbar tract innervates the muscles of the face, the head, and the neck, and the muscles that are involved in swallowing phonation, as well as facial expression. Now, this is now how you memorize things if you're preparing for an exam. So please remember this. The primary motor cortex, the upper motor neuron, primary motor cortex, so it's from the primary motor cortex, then the corona radiata, then the internal capsule until it reaches the brainstem. So what is the main difference between the corticospinal tract and the cortical bulbar or cortical nuclear tract? Where does the cortical nuclear tract end? It ends in the brainstem. Please. Remember this. So please remember this. Now, 
These are the three parts of the brainstem. We have the midbrain, we have the pons, we have the medulla oblongata. Now, you can find the following cranial nerves in the nuclei in the midbrain. We have the oculomotor, which is cranial nerve three. We have the trochlear, which is cranial nerve four. Then we have the abducens, which is cranial nerve six. Now, tip. Remember this. In the midbrain, it is letter M, mata, which in Filipino means the eyes. These cranial nerves supply the extraocular muscles. So cranial nerve three, cranial nerve four, cranial nerve six. What is that famous uh, anatomy pearl again? That all extraocular muscles are innervated by cranial nerve three, except for LR six, SO four. Lateral rectus is innervated by cranial nerve six. The superior oblique is innervated by cranial nerve four. Now, what about the pawns? We find the following motor nuclei of the facial nerve, that's cranial nerve seven, and cranial nerve five, which is the trigeminal nerve. In the medulla oblongata, we have cranial nerve nine, nuclei, motor nuclei, and cranial nerve 11, the spinal accessory nerve. Please remember this. So here, very nice illustration. This is the midbrain, cranial nerve 3 nuclei, cranial nerve 4 nuclei. Part of cranial nerve 5 is part midbrain and pons. Here's the medulla oblongata. So 9, 10, 11, and 12. Here's cranial nerve 12. Now, the cortical nuclear tract carries upper motor neuron input to the motor nuclei of the following. Number one, the trigeminal. Number two, the facial. Glossopharyngeal and the accessory or spinal accessory nerves. Please memorize this, that the cortical nuclear or the cortical bulbar tract carries input, motor inputs to the following cranial nerve nuclei, trigeminal, facial, glossopharyngeal, and the spinal accessory nerve. So this is cranial nerve five, seven, nine, 11, five, seven, nine, and 11. You just add two. Five plus two is seven. Seven plus two is nine. Nine plus two is 11. This is all cortical bulbar, also known as cortical nuclear. Okay, so please take note of the following nerves, which we enumerated earlier. Now, what about trigeminal nerve or cranial nerve number five? Okay, so we have here the sensory root, which is shaded in yellow, and we have the motor root. Okay, and always remember that the motor component of the trigeminal nerve supplies the muscles of mastication. Okay, so we have the masseter, okay, we have the pterygoid, lateral pterygoid, we have the medial pterygoid. Now, which one opens the mouth? Okay, the one that opens the mouth is the lateral pterygoid, because when you say the word la, 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 you open the mouth. What closes the mouth, okay, or elevates the jaw is the medial pterygoid. Because when you say me, 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 you are closing the mouth. When you say la, 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 you are opening the mouth, okay? So please take note of that. Now for the facial nerve, I want you to remember 
that there's bilateral innervation of the facial nerve. So if there is a lesion of the facial nerve, the patient will present with Bell's palsy. And take note, in Bell's palsy, they cannot wrinkle the forehead. They will have poor eyelid closure and they're gonna have a facial asymmetry and they won't be able to whistle, they won't be able to blow because the buccinator, which is the trumpeteer's muscle, is damaged, okay? So please take note of that. So as you can see in a peripheral facial nerve lesion, there's bilateral innervation. So please take note of that. Now here's the facial nerve, okay, right here. The facial nerve actually pierces the parotid gland and divides the parotid gland into a superficial and a deep lobe. So very important, especially for the surgeon. Now, I want everyone to remember this. These are the five terminal branches of the facial nerve. So my mnemonics is 10 zebras bit my cheek, okay? So as you can see, if you put your five fingers here on your face, it's striped, so striped like a zebra. So here's the temporal, zygomatic branch, the buccal, the mandibular, then we have the cervical branch. So please remember this, okay? So this is how it's gonna look. So look at the facial nerve branches, the ones that are highlighted in yellow. Okay, so don't forget the five branches, okay? Now, the glossopharyngeal nerve innervates the muscles of the larynx. Okay, it inner innervates the muscles of the larynx and innervates the larynx itself. So the spinal accessory nerve, that's cranial nerve 11, would innervate the following two muscles. Remember this, the sternocleidomastoid, then we have the trapecius. Okay, the sternocleidomastoid, then we have the trapecius. So please take note of this, okay? Now, Please memorize this. The difference between an upper motor neuron and a lower motor neuron. Now, can you type in the chat box, what is that landmark again, which separates the upper and the lower motor neuron? What is that cell which is found in the spinal cord, okay? Which separates or is the boundary between upper and lower motor neuron? It is the anterior horn cell, okay, the anterior horn cell. So beyond the anterior horn cell, that's lower motor neuron. Now, upper motor neuron presents with spastic paresis, okay, paralysis, which is spastic, hard, matigas, gahe. So there's going to be increased muscle spasticity. The tendon reflexes are usually hyperreflexia. So the DTRs are usually hyperreflexic, okay? While in lower motor neuron, there's flaccidity, there's loss of muscle tone, and there's going to be loss of reflexes. There's usually atrophy of the muscle, as well as the presence of fasciculations in a lower motor neuron lesion. In an upper motor neuron lesion, we have the famous Babinski sign, okay, wherein there's going to be dorsiflexion of the big toe and fanning of the small toes. Okay, so always remember classic pyramidal sign. It's upper motor neuron, that is Babinski. So examples of upper motor neuron disease is stroke. Okay, that's why in stroke, there's paresis, and later there's going to be spasticity, and later there's going to be hyperreflexia. And usually you would witness on physical exam the presence of a Babinski. While a lower motor neuron, example of lower motor neuron, is ALS or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, the peripheral neuropathies, poliomyelitis, is also an example of a lower motor 
neuron disease. Okay, so please take note of that. Now, clinical aspect as to regards the level of crossing. Please remember this. So if the corticospinal tract is affected and there is an injury which is above the pyramidal decussation, this leads to contralateral motor deficits. If the damage is below the pyramidal decussation, such as the damage is in the cerebellum, then the lesion would result to paralysis or motor deficits on the ipsilateral. Okay, please remember this. Okay, and another clinical aspect on the level of crossing of the corticospinal as well as the corticobulbar, lower motor, upper motor neurons is this. Lower motor neurons of the musculature of the body receive motor input usually from the contralateral hemisphere. Okay, lower motor nuclei of the cranial nerves receive bilateral innervation. Okay, so if you see a patient in the emergency room or in your clinic with bilateral cranial nerve nuclei involvement, okay, then you start thinking of brainstem. You start thinking of the corticobulbar rather than having damage to the corticospinal tract because the corticospinal tract is contralateral, okay? So that ends the corticobulbar pathway.